So, um, what I want to do in this last mm -hmm. talk is how, uh, to exemplify how we can use geometric morphometrics to understand the analytical units with which we prescribe to certain some tool assemblages, and this can be applied to different various pe uh, periods and artifacts. I want to focus specifically on the final paralytic because that's what I'm employed for. And uh, I want to look at how we can deconstruct the sort of the ethnogeographic variability which is perceived during this period. Um, and then using this empirical framework, begin to think about constructing new forms of taxa, new uh, based in cultural evolutionary theory. So in the pursuit of understanding the true nature of structure present throughout the Paleolithic, it's a fundamental precondition uh, that we have the un unambiguous definition of an analytical unit. Um, steeped in rich history, the, de the definition of taxonomic units were a great concern to early practitioners and can be traced back to the origins of the typological method, which we're all familiar with. Um, however, these traditional European-centric approaches to lithic analysis, focusing on types and key sites, have often created uncertainties and ambiguities in the analytical units with which we use. For the old world particularly, uh, these debates have been long-standing, whether this be the Middle and Upper Palaeolithic of Eurasia, where the Epipalaeolithic of the Levant, uh, or the Final Palaeolithic of Northern Asia. However, in many instances, meaningful structure can be solved. For the Final Palaeolithic, we can talk about specific stone tools which have specific technological characters, which are in a sense, appropriate units. Um, and we can think about, think about the work of Karen Rubens and William Rendu in the middle panel. And so we're left with some problems as uh, a Paleolithic archaeologist. Basically, there are issues in capturing meaningful structure within the period and in different periods of the Paleolithic, um, particularly when there are a myriad of terms which are adopted, both on regional, national, international levels. Um, there's then the issue of how do we objectively determine structure um, at what point does an analysis become logical consistency for a new analytical unit? Um, how can we identify what Barton nearly calls so-called so phantom cultures, cultures which don't exist only in the, we, in the means with which we've made them? Um, and thinking more broadly, how do we as archaeologists support the notions made by different researchers testing these analytical units um, and finally abandon these old terms? They're there in the literature and we continue to use them day after day still. So perhaps one of the most uncertain periods and one of the most confusing for taxonomy is the final paleolithic of Northern Europe, where the myriad of terms used for these populations have often thought to reflect per uh, perceived prehistoric ethnogeographic variability. Uh, this is best exemplified by the work of uh, Schwab and here, who in this sort of martial-like chronology of the final paleolithic talks about a myriad of different uh, units. So some of you may be familiar with the Federmesser, but then within the Federmesser, you can have the Younger, the Rissner, the Wielner, and you can have up to 40 to 50 different names for different units. And before you know, we think about how we are going to adopt these, uh, you know, how we're going to create new units, you have to consider the research historical framework that I've already touched upon briefly. Uh, it's not new. Hutzman 996 perhaps best highlighted this need uh, for us to escape the constraints of contemporary national borders and the paradigmatic straitjackets of provincialism and regional chauvinism. Um, one here can also include sort of lost in translation issues, where these have been raised, but maybe in a small journal in a certain country. And the anglophonic audience, which is the most common audience for these debates, just don't interact with that evidence. Um, and this is, you know, this is particularly uh, so for the Upper Paleolithic and for the Final Paleolithic. Um, more work on this aspect recently covered by you know, my colleague Felix Reader highlighted how these are created on different uh, means, whether that be a specific artifact by a certain shape, whether that's the amount of raw material to use, the types of different uh, tools. Um, and so we have to figure out how we're going to um, collect all these together and actually construct these new analytical units. Those which have emphasized the importance of a research historical perspective in understanding these units have highlighted the necessity for rigorous, high-resolution methods, which can test the robustness of the groups and artifact types, identify possible redundancies, and even hint at new taxonomic structures. This again is not new for the final paleolithic, and one can consider the work of Barton and Neal in this regard. Um, however, they were using uh, 
back in the 80s and 90s, much more lineal methods, not as powerful. And for European archaeologists in this um, period, first period, we haven't really adopted the sort of the American school. We can get sort of phylogenetics and the much more powerful morphometric approaches. And so to test the validity of many of these groupings, we utilized a two-dimensional geometric morphometric methodology of 2,361 artifacts, covering as much of Northern Europe as possible and ranging from two artifact classes. So we've got the tanged points known for their tangs at the base of the blade, and backed points with their continuous width edge along the, uh, the lateral side. Um, and here it is worth stressing that as well as the, you have these sides which have either or, you do get those which have both. And this is something we have to revisit when we're thinking about these units, because these are going to be the best means for constructing the units. And so the actual CAA component, um, the, uh, yeah, you're waiting for it. The illustrations of backed and tanged points were first converted to XY raw coordinates um, in MoMAX for R. We used illustrations because of their abundance, not because of the quality. Obviously, in the ideal world, we'd have 3D scans left, right, and center. But if we're analyzing these terms, which are based upon artifacts, I can't go to Poland every week and have a look at them. I have to deal within my means. Um, and given the problem in identifying a number of corresponding landmarks on these artifacts, an outline-based approach was favored, and particularly elliptic fear analysis, a common means for uh, performing outline analysis in archaeology. Through the parametric functions underpinning EFA, as developed by Giordino and Cole, a degree of harmonic power, so fundamentally the exactness of the shape in question, can be analyzed, and this was calculated through Vincent Bonham's calibrated harmonic power function in MoMOX. The coefficients were then analyzed through their respective archaeological taxonomic units, which I'll touch upon in a minute, um, which in essence originate from David Clark's population histories, technocomplexes, industries, assemblages, etc. We then tested the analytical robustness of these ATUs through typical multivariate testing and discrimination analysis to get a better understanding of how robust they are. And in taking inspiration from Joseph Wilkes' 2015 paper, we can get uh, plan, practice, and PAL staves, we started to consider self-organizing maps, so a class of neural network algorithms, as another way of exploring this um, data. So in a principal component analysis, the outlier strongly affects the overall representation of your data. And any possible structure within the set of most common artifacts is projected in the center and can often be blurred when you're looking at these different units. The self-organizing maps in comparison allow a multidimensional data set to be projected in a lower dimensional space, as a lattice, as a series of circles, um, and can provide another means of understanding the clusters of large data sets. This is done through what's known as like codebook vectors, um, representing the locations of the original data, which are then uh, initiated, displaced, and there's an iterative uh, component which then brings out the best possible groupings. And through Gaussian mixture modeling, which is a type of probabilistic uh, membership association technique, you can then determine how many actual groups there are. Um, I'm only going to present the first bit on that because that was something I started this week. Um, and in the construction of new analytical units, uh, Felix particularly, we wanted to focus more on a cultural evolutionary approach. We wanted to actually focus on how these units became to be, or how the artifacts became to be, and how they were transmitted throughout the few thousand years. Um, cluster analyses are wonderful for that, but they don't give you any type of temporal meaning. There's no rooting in a tree, there's no um, divisions which can be made. And so we took the principal component scores rooted from um, the, the GM data and we uh, originated from the GM data and we rooted the Magdalenian examples, the oldest examples, at the base of the tree. Um, this was done through the extension of Phylip in R, so R Phylip. Um, it's very computationally demanding as well. The tangent point tree alone took four days and the archback point one on my computer I haven't finished yet and I started two weeks ago, two and a half. So I need to find more uh, computational power. Um, we do not assume that these trees are going to be perfect because the nature of the transmission systems which have taken place, horizontal and vertical, they're not going to be uh, represented in the tree as well, but it will provide a new means for understanding the nature of shape change throughout the period, particularly when we are dealing with 
uh, absolute dates. Um, so yeah, this was done through the R filet package and R based filet interface with additional visualizations and analyses using ggtree, tidytree, and ape. Again, all in R. Um, it's my aim personally to make sure that all of this is within one script in R, which then we can send out to everyone. And then if people want to apply it to the upper Paleolithic or the Levant, or they can just then, you know, insert their data, reiterate, and, and get through it, and then also allow for more meaningful discussions on this. Um, yesterday, uh, while I was in one of the sessions, we had our, our paper accepted for Nature Powergrave Communications, which highlights much of the theoretical framework for this. So in a few weeks, I think it's four weeks, that will be published, and um, we'd recommend that as a way of understanding the relationship between these outlines and uh, a cultural evolutionary approach. And then just to show the protocol, the illustrations, go to outlines, which are they can't see that well, centered, scaled, performed it flow through analyses, and then etc. Um, and here, just for greater clarity, is what I was referring to about the ATUs, the Gamble et al. 2005. So you have different levels represented, sort of period, subperiod, period, complex culture. Um, it's by no means perfect. People talk about the Federmester as one entity, such as a techno complex, as others will refer to it as consisting of three other groups. So, trying to figure out what ATU you're in is not so easy, but uh, it's a good means to start examining and constructing these units. And so, for some examples, uh, here's what's defined as ATU2, and we can see some element of structure within the back points, as demonstrable in the graph on the left. We see various units, including the Hamburgian, the Tang point complex, the Epigravetti, very distinguishable, overlapping in the Laborian groupings, and significant homogenization between the Federmesser, the Amersbergian, and the Azillian. This Azillian Federmesser is unsurprising because it's used interchangeably. Um, it's important to highlight that the ATU system is wonderful, but if archaeologists are not going to actually name what they are, then we can't analyze them. We're not going to say it's a Federmesser site or any site. And so we had 809 artifacts in total, which were not subject to this analysis, uh, which is why we need more of these probabilistic methods. Uh, for tang point variants, less structure is present with only significant differences noted for those terms, the tang point techno complex, the Eastern European variant. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the maneuvers and discrimination analysis here, just for the sake of time, but they also reinforce many of the patterns which you see in the confidence ellipses. On the ATU free scale, uh, the level with the greatest amount of different analytical units, you can just see it's a clusterfuck of terms. Just, you know, we just use terms just so varied, and this is what comes out. And uh, for back to point variants, Eastern European variants, like the Swidri, the Witto, the Tarnarian, uh, they demonstrate some difference in comparison to a greater number of units. Other units, including the Probs, Fowls, Tolks, Brown, Gats, and Offer, they also demonstrate significant difference. Uh, this latter unit, the Atsanoff, is perhaps the most interesting for final paleolithic people because it's defined by the use of a non-flint material. And so here we're sort of having a more of an insight into raw material in shape. Um, and it's also important to note areas of homogenization, including the Federmesser variant um, just on the, on the right here. Um, for tang point variants, problems with the current taxonomic system really do appear, and you just can't really differentiate between many of the samples. Um, but they represent the groups and the units, not the actual named artifacts, because you can also have named artifact types. And um, this lower possible analytical unit, again, dissimilarities can be noticed, uh, including the Tauker, the Petersfeld, the Blanchere. They're all distinguishable from the myriad of terms with which there are. Um, however, with many of these examples featuring relatively low counts, and this is still a problem, even in terms of you know, a big data set such as this. You can have 2,300 artifacts, but if you've only got 10 artifacts representing a unit, you're not going to really have the statistical power through conventional uh, multivariate analysis. So, um, just to touch upon some of the stuff I've been doing in the last few weeks, this is the self-organizing maps I've mentioned in these sort of neural networks. Um, each one of these represents a pattern in the skull and in the shape. And then you can designate, then the uh, analysis designates and tells you where the groupings are. 
in the three main clusters, which are represented just by mean shapes of the overall data set, there's no uh, obvious spatial variation at present. Um, the, these aren't the actual predetermined groups. These are just the uh, code groups which have been made. Um, the sort of the k-means clustering method uh, needs to be implemented. But it's just highlighting what else can be done beyond conventional means. Um, much more interestingly for us is this idea of the cultural phylogeny. And this is the tanged point example, um, originating from Abbe uh, Fontal, a Magdalene example. Um, and we can start to see some clusters appear, different clades, different, you know, different levels. And if we plot this, um, if we examine this within a spatial temporal framework, then we can begin to see patterns. So if we just happen to take this clade, for example, um, yes, there are a few examples in Denmark, but four sites representing oh, you know, about 500, uh, not 500, about 50 artifacts are represented in this one clade. And so we can use this as a new way to start to think about these new analytical units. So instead of just going for principal component analysis and the multivariate manoeuvre, we can start to actually think about getting rid of some terms, however controversial that may be, however upsetting that may be to people who have conceived them and wrote down and stuff. And, um, we can actually develop a new way of understanding these artifact classes. Um, now, this isn't perfect, because, uh, you know, some of the same we did a few weeks ago. Um, but GM allows an analytical and statistical framework to be provided for identifying many of these ghost cultures. It can identify meaningful structure, and through the maximum likelihood tree, we can start to hint at what, it, what was going on in the past in terms of these shape variances. Uh, comparative methods aren't necessary for that tree, it's just I just wanted to show that today. Um, other issues, you know, I've mentioned the sample sizes for particular units, um, the assumption of a vertical transmission method, it won't always please everyone, but you know, we assumed it just went down vertical. Um, but hopefully you can see within this talk that uh, GM, and particularly GM in R, because you know, pushing the, the R uh, vote here, provides a solid starting point for having better analytical units. Uh, upon completion, as you know, this is a large workflow, all data script trees, outputs, they will be provided, and we really encourage uh, an interaction with them, just so we can not have one person dictate and go, yes, these are the new units, you know, like sim on the mount or whatever, but that we can all negotiate and understand what's going on and really get towards constructing these new units. Um, so thank you for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed this session as well.